And which states is the middle class thriving, mm -hmm. right? It's all the red states. There is no middle class in California. You're a Marine? Yeah, yeah. And you were a cop for how many years? Uh, six years. I should be your, your sort of your prototypical knuckle dragger. Like, I still like to joke about that. I like to say, well, you know, uh, what what does a knuckle dragger like me know, mm -hmm. right? But I, I really looked at to, and I was an English major too, so this really helped sort of frame. You got um, big brain energy. <laughs> so this sort of helped frame the, a lot of the conversation that we're having today. Is why is this? Why is this? Well, it goes back to this postmodernist philosophy, right? Because the West had primarily been working under Enlightenment era philosophy, rationale, reason, reason, you know, scientific method, mm -hmm. and all. So enter. The 19, I'd say, well, uh, spitball 1980s, right? You have these French philosophers, all of whom were, were pretty, kind of mentally ill. Mm -hmm. You know, they all were, they, they were mentally ill, a lot of them. Michel Foucault, all of these guys were deranged in their own right, and they hated structure. They viewed the world uh, as in the lens that came from a heteronormative. All of the buzzwords that you're hearing, you know, heteronormative, everything's through, you know, these science as a... a patriarchal sort of system that's been established. Mm. Everything that we know to be normal in the West and that standard that has really raised the West to its prominence is under attack by postmodernism. Postmodernism would say, well, I'm the receiver. I'm receiving the information. There's no such thing as objectivity. I'm rece You're receiving the information in a lens in which you want to receive the information. So I say that's a chair. You say, well, no, it's not a chair. It's, it's just four legs and some cushions. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's this deconstructionist view of things as to why things like gender can't exist in a binary lens. What's the point, though? That's that's where my brain goes. Like, where where is the end game actually going to? Because I have to look at everything from a logical perspective. Right. I'm a business person. I'm very logical. I look at things kind of analytically. So, like, okay, if we're starting here, and we're progressing to the point of, in my opinion, it's, it's getting a little into madness. You know, it's, it's just not making sense anymore. What's the goal? Where, where is this actually going? Where is the end game for this whole scenario? Do they have one? Or is this just kind of like, everybody, let's play make-believe imaginary land until things are just completely haywire and nobody knows what's up and down. The end goal is that there is no end goal. This is just a, I know it's kind of, it's like, what, what do you mean there is no end goal, right? That doesn't logically make sense. Now, everything we're seeing is also an outgrowth of some sort of Marxism, right? And mm -hmm. Marxism, socialism, kind, communism just doesn't know how. They operate in this utopian vision. But once, it, once you get down to it, they know what the end game is. The architects know what it is, and that's total control. Mm -hmm. That's what the end game is. Now, in order to get that control, you must create chaos. So it's why we see now in local, why local law enforcement has been eviscerated over the past 10 plus years, as you and I both know, order is a hallmark of the free market, right? You believe that when you wake up in the morning, the government's gonna do three, three things, right? Your contracts are gonna be enforced, your person's gonna be protected, your property is gonna be protected as well. You know, you've got George Soros, who is throwing hundreds of thousands of dollars into district attorney's races at, in very rural parts of the country. $200,000 to a district attorney in West Virginia. That's a tremendous amount of money. But once you get certain property crimes that are no longer being enforced, right? They're being no pros, they're being no filed. They're, they're just saying, well, you know, we can't prove that the car was stolen. Well, why'd the guy run? Why'd he, him and his buddies bail out of the car? Why is there, uh, you know, a screwdriver in the ignition? Well, why are all these circumstantial evidence and facts pointing to the guy was culpable to that theft? You don't get a clear explanation because the DA simply don't want to dedicate the resources to investigate that. So the, the end game is disorder and chaos. And then who comes to save the day? The nanny state does. The daddy government comes to save the day. You pretty much summed up why I hated the last few years of my law enforcement career. Everything, every case that I did, didn't matter how much evidence there was. I mean, you could literally have video evidence, you could have physical evidence, you could have uh, eyewitness testimony, and you have a testimony of a law enforcement officer. It really doesn't matter. And all that I saw from the state attorney's offices here in Florida, their state attorneys, um, assistant state attorneys, all they would say is basically, well, you know, we'd rather plea out for X or minimize the charge to this because we know it'll win. All they cared about was a track record. 100%. Because every single one of these state attorneys in the state attorney office cared about their record so they can then use that to leave and then go be defense attorney somewhere else. 100%. That's It, it was literally nobody used it for an actual career or 
you know, anything that was actually making a net positive in society. What year did you start in law enforcement? Uh, 2013. I went to Academy in 2007. So I saw a little more, you kind right. of started when it was already kind of it was shifting. Yeah. It was yeah. getting a little shitty at that point. Um, I remember going through, uh, in my early years and Obama was president. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't care what anybody says about him and people think he is like the savior of politics and of, uh, the country and everything like that. That guy hated law enforcement and he was very nasty to the law enforcement community, uh, to the point where I remember during a police memorial week, we were there and police memorial week, he gave this speech half of the crowd, which were uniformed class A law enforcement, you know, in, in our in our dress blues, half of them publicly and loudly stood up from their seats and about face and turned their back on the president of the United States. I was there to witness that. It was pretty drastic. And I mean, and that wasn't televised. Nobody saw that. But his policies were very anti-law enforcement. And I think that just progressed. And, you know, none of it really got fixed through Trump, in my opinion. No, no. Um, and you know, now with Biden, it's, it's even more of a mess. Um, but the law enforcement career that you and I started with doesn't exist now. I joined that career field to just go catch bad guys. Like that was my fundamental, like, I want to go catch the bad guys. I want to go protect the citizens. Mm -hmm. I want to go out there. I want to get the job done. I want to do it in, you know, a constitutionally sound manner. I want to keep, you know, ferocious student of case law was a Mm -hmm. ferocious student of you know, um, these updates that they would pump out. So I knew that I was doing my job. So in a worst case scenario, if it goes all the way to trial, I can sit there and they can cross examine me and they can depose me and they can try to throw everything out, but it's going to be lock solid because my fundamental thesis for doing the job was to get the bad guys and put them in jail, put them away in prison. And then you start to see really how it worked. And you start to see that you would get more grief for saying, a curse word. Citizens don't understand. I say, you don't tell me how to do my job mm-hmm. if you wouldn't drive through that same neighborhood with your windows down, your doors unlocked, but you have to stop, you have to get out, and you have to interact. Now, that's not to say that I didn't build rapport with the guys on the streets, right? Sure. Because that was the human element, which I had the luxury of being in a smaller city, right? The bad guys made up a smaller demographic. Moreover, the very violent bad guys made up a smaller percentage of that. But you had enough of a, of a siloed, siloized group where you can go out and you can get to know them. And you, one of my mentors on the job taught me that. He was a tremendous detective. I mean, to the point where when he unfortunately passed a cancer, guys on the street knew about that and were stopping us and saying, hey, sorry about 6ix9ine, man. We, we heard about what happened to him, and he was a, he was a real one. He, like, sorry about that. And, um, you know, that was the, the rapport. But ultimately, when it got down to business, and these guys were running and throwing guns and, you know, throwing drugs and you're chasing them after they're bailing out of a shooting car. You know, there's no niceties being exchanged. It, yeah. <laughs> it's no, there's no, there's no, you know, sir, please stop, sir, mm-hmm. please, you know, you, you, that's done. That's well, done. Most of the people that are crit- very, very critical of law enforcement, they have no clue what the job actually is. I've, I realized that very early on in my career when, I mean, I don't think anybody's ever really loved police, like in a, in a right, mass, right, you know right. what I mean? We all, you know, all the time law enforcement get a very bad rep. I, I'm friends with all of the guys I used to work with. I'm sure you are too. Right, yeah. You know, and they tell me, they're like, man, you got out at a good time. <laughs> you know, because they're like, it got worse from the public perspective. Right, right. But it also got worse from the administration perspective because of this culture shift, you know? They're not able to be protected by their superiors, by the chief of police, by the mayor, things like that. People can't even do their normal jobs anymore. Look at the military. I touched on that on the last episode, and I got a lot of grief for that one, <laughs> even from some military guys. And they're like, you know, how dare you talk about the, your military that way? You know, I thought you were a patriot. This and that. I got messages like that. And I'm like, I'm just reporting what I'm seeing. Right. I am seeing that there is a downfall of what the military is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a bunch of walking badasses. Men and women. I'm not just talking about men. It doesn't have to be a masculine thing. There are some badass women there in the military. There are 100%. You know, you, you've been I've with seen them. It. I, I guarantee it. I've seen it. I have a couple female friends that were Marines, um, retired, and they're badasses. I would not mess with Hard them. Hard-charging ladies. Yeah. Hard-charging ladies. You know, but the military doesn't seem like it's really pushing that anymore. It's pushing like a kinder, gentler... I don't, I don't know. That's not what the military's for. I always like to know the genesis of things. And, you know, the, the father of cultural Marxism was Antonio Gramsci, right? And, and Gramsci was an Italian 
political dissident, and I'll keep the, I'll condense this for our viewers, mm -hmm. but basically political dissident was locked up for being a communist party member by, by Mussolini. And he wrote, he said, you know, traditional Marxist revolutions really thought that there would be a leader amongst men. There would be sort of a leader of the proletariat that would lead to this great revolution. Well, he flipped that on its head and said, well, it needs to start through the culture. Once you control the cultural institutions and you're controlling the cultural dialogue and discourse, you frame it in a Marxist setting. Now, all of a sudden, what you've got is you've got individual revolutionary leaders, right? So the revolution is being installed into the individual. And we're starting, once again, we're seeing that. We're seeing these outgrowths, and it's at every level of government. It's at every level of culture. It's in the military. I'd say it's probably maybe lieutenant colonel, colonel up. Okay. Right. So your middle off your 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 middle off oh oh five oh six up because once you become a colonel, a brigadier general, all the way through general, you start to become a politician in uniform. By and large, now that's not to say a broad stroke, but that tends to be meaning the politics will start to influence your daily your decision, activity. Correct. Your decisions, right. Scott. Because now you're jockeying to get certain um, appointments. You're mm -hmm. spending more time in D.C. You're not with the guys on the ground. The boots on the ground guys are through and through patriots from every corner of the country that I spent time with in the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're, they're out there. They all have their reasons for joining, but you know, they're still captured under the umbrella of, you know, God, country, and core. I would hate to go straight into politics like that, but when I hear God, country, patriot, when I hear those things, my mind, and I'm sorry anybody that would <laughs> yell at me for saying this, but my mind automatically goes to a conservative person. Is, did you see that in the military? And is that something that you have talked to people about? Are most of those people also conservative in politics? Politics, when I was in, really wasn't, it wasn't a, a high level. It wasn't an issue, right? It really sure. wasn't as prominent as it is now. Mm -hmm. I think that we've gone more towards a generally secular society. My opinion, and this might be a controversial opinion, I think most people are conservative. And this is my rationale. I think most people are conservative because they want a few things to be consistent. They want opportunity. Mm -hmm. They want economic prosperity. Sure. Stability at minimum. They want the United States, right? The United States as, as a country to be prosperous. Now, you can get down into the minutia and once you, you can parse apart these different uh, little data points. But I think by and large, people agree on many things. I think where the issue is, is you have the unengaged consumer. They're being spoon fed the information. Mm -hmm. But when you really speak with them, they say, well, you know, yeah, maybe, you know, I may, maybe I'm not getting as much for my taxes as I would like to see. Um, you know, well, yeah, I think everybody should have the opportunity to, to make money, you know, or, or, or advance in their specific career. Yeah, you know, I think women and, you know, minorities and everyone else should have an equal hack at it. Now, what happens is that the, the sort of the discourse managers, the discourse leaders in the mainstream media contort these messages, right? So they contort it to fit their specific ends, to put us in little camps, put us in little silos mm -hmm. and say, well, these guys, you shouldn't like these guys because of this specific discrepancy. Now, you've had some experience with the media. Uh, you were involved in, remind me. Uh, Turn Turning Point, yeah. Turning, Turning Point. Point USA. Explain real quick for anybody who doesn't know what that is. Uh, so Turning Point USA is a nonprofit that engages uh, the discourse on university campuses to promote a pro-free market, pro-limited government approach, anti-communism, anti-socialism, and, okay. and really these cultural war issues. When I look at what college campuses have become, that's what you're fighting against. Right, right, right. Okay. We see uh, a lot of these big-time conservative speakers coming in, and they are just berated by these, you know, hardcore leftists, you know, uh, for no reason. It's a tactic, right? Because they can't allow repressive tolerance, right? So there's a legitimate doctrine on this. Now, the most center-right voice on the right mm -hmm. it needs to be dealt with in such a swift and violent manner so that there's no way the message can be delivered because conservative, right, enlightenment, free market messaging will beat leftist, communist, centralization, centralized power messaging 10 times out of 10. In large, you think most of the population is actually more conservative than we... I think so. I like to say and look at where the commonalities lie. I think if you're conservative, you're by and large going to be a Republican. Or you can be an independent, but you can still have those conservative. Because what's conservative now, right, versus what's conservative circa 1920? Well, that line shifted. 
the line has 100 percent shifted. It's moved. I mean, the spectrum has shifted exponentially. And the parties have shifted as well. And I always think I have a. I, it's always the institution versus everybody else, mm -hmm. and whether you are on the part of like the well, I'd say establishment, right? It's the establishment versus everyone else. Eight out of the top 10 Fortune 500 companies, their CEO identifies as Democrat. Those numbers were reversed in 1992. Do you so, think that's real, though? Do you think they're actually doing that because they truly believe in what they're in, what that party or what those politics are saying? Or do you think they're doing that just so they don't get, quote unquote, canceled or, uh, you know, anything else, get negative media attention? Do you think maybe it's people that are having to really hide who they really are? Okay. I do think it's a part of that. But also, look, you've got 40 years of leftist indoctrination on college campuses. Right. So you've got you're having to fight those headwinds when you're trying to get the message out of, mm -hmm. of, of just just general like pro-American thought. Right. Pro-American ideas. Well, where do you think it's going to go? I mean, because I'm seeing the younger and younger generations and I mean, they're interested in socialism, not interested in anything traditional. Right. Like traditional, traditional masculine, feminine household. Um, traditional roles in the household, uh, jobs, product, anything. You know, everything has kind of been flipped upside down. Yeah. And I think it's putting them into a very confused space, you know, where these younger generations are so confused and they're not really able to identify what they're really supposed to be or what they're really supposed to be doing right. or how they're supposed to be behaving. It's making them depressed. It's causing mental health issues. It's causing a lot of confusion all the way down the line, you know, it, is that going to be something that we're going to be seeing more in the West here over the next maybe two, three decades as these kids are starting to grow up into this even more? Because, I mean, you know, the kids on, in college campus right now, they had 20 years with their parents. Right. Maybe their parents are also giving some influence. Absolutely. So they're not going to be completely gone and lost to this ideology. But the kids now, I mean, these are millennials that are now having children. So the children that are being born right now to millennial you know, generation, they're probably going to be indoctrinated at home, then at school, then in college, then at the workplace. What What is that generation going to look like? So millennials bucked against this trend of that the Gen Xers really embrace, right? So mm -hmm. let's hope that with millennials having a disproportionate sort of leaning towards communism, socialism, leftism, that the cool thing will to be now will to be a free market absolute absolutist, right? So like I'm pro free market, I am pro whatever religion one prescribes to Judeo Christian is a Judeo Christian country, whether we like to admit it or not. Well, don't, it, say look, that too, don't say that say that too loud. It's it's the truth. I mean, hey, look, um I'm sorry. It is, it is. No, you're right. I mean, it was founded on Judeo Christian principles. Right, right. People that try to dispute that. I, I kind of laugh at them. I'm like, I'm like, you really don't know the history of the country. And then, and then it's funny because those same people that try to dispute that are the same people that are trying to to tell people in the Middle East how they should be living their life. The real question is, who's the bad guy in this conversation? Is it other people telling people how they should live, right? Or is it the people that are living the way that suits their specific, you know, their specific way of life? Well, and that's the problem. People people get all bent out of shape when they don't agree with something. The last podcast episode that we aired, I talked a little bit about Andrew Tate. Right, yeah. I had a lot of friends, family, uh, even people that work for me in my companies um, kind of ask me questions. Well, you know, don't you think he's a misogynist? Don't you think he's sexist? Don't you, you know, he, he, he hates women, this and that. I'm like, why do you think all these things? And, you know, they, they give me their explanation on things that he said. I personally think he says a lot of those things because... Yeah. He wants the attention. 100%. You know, it's this is a marketing ploy. Ab absolutely. It's a marketing ploy, and he's really smart for doing it that way. Well, he's a he's like a grand chess master, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, come on, the guy's playing. Yeah. I'm sure every move he makes is there's some sort of whether or not the, the human trafficking allegations are true. Let's say he was a criminal mastermind. Mm -hmm. Let's let's play the what if game. And in the course of him doing his criminal mastermind, right, his human trafficking enterprise. Mm -hmm. The whole time he's saying, go against the matrix, go against the matrix, go against the matrix. He's controlling the public discourse because the minute he gets accused of something or he's arrested of something, he can say, ha ha, see, look, it's the matrix. They're coming they came after, after me. me. That's 100%. right. hundred <laughs> percent. The guy, I mean, look, he's playing chess. Yeah. That's all it is. It's a yeah. chess game. You know, I, I'm not hundred percent sure on the allegations. I don't know the guy, you know, uh, I, I did get to uh, spend a little bit of time with Patrick Bed David who interviewed him. Um, and I, asked him very short, quick question about it. And he was just like, 
The guy is more than likely, you know, maybe not verified, more than likely a high level genius IQ. Uh, uh, I could, I could see that. And I consider Patrick very, very intelligent. So, you know, he's, Patrick is probably also of a genius IQ level. You know, the guy's made, I mean, I don't even know how many countless hundreds of millions, uh, you know, in his, uh, in his life. And, you know, he was a refugee from Iran, came over here with nothing, was in the military. The guy killed it. To comment on that, to sort of sidebar on that, we have so much abundance in this country. We have so much opportunity. It's it's unfathomable. I would say, I'd make the argument that a hourly wage worker in 2023 had a better life than a 15th century king. Because you can have a... a 17 bedroom, 10,000 square foot palace, but you have no AC, Mm -hmm. you have no running, you know, sewer. Mm -hmm. You basically are living in a very sparse time. Everyone is so comfortable. And I think the outgrowth of comfort and what I've seen with, let's say, second and third generation wealth, Mm -hmm. the kids of those second, it's it's an entitlement mentality. Whereas you have your first generation immigrants, right? Whether you're from Iran, I know a lot of successful sort of, we'll say, you know, Iranian, Persian, you know, pre-Iran revolution, where they came here with nothing, Cuban Americans, Venezuelan Americans, you know, uh, Eastern Europeans. My country's from Yugoslavia. You're, you're, you, I mean, you're, you're a prime example. It's people who understand that the opportunities that exist that don't operate within an entitlement mentality. We're too fat. We're too happy. You know, uh, now all of these minor issues now need to become existential issues because everything else is covered. Yeah, they have to make problems up because there there really aren't real problems. There's like a human nature to have problems. It's like the human proclivity to to, to sort of crusade for something. We can completely unpack that. I mean, look at how much people complain about literally everything and almost to the point where they're making up things to complain about, you know, which kind of goes into that woke ideology type of uh, mentality. You know, do you actually have a problem? Is anybody messing with you because of the way that you are identifying? I don't think anybody actually cares. No. I don't care. No. I consider myself conservative, but from a party perspective, I'm almost more libertarian. Right. I I like very small government, which unfortunately, you know, I, I was very happy with Republican Party maybe well over a decade ago. Right, right. You know, especially when I was in law enforcement. Um, I was very big into it. Recently, man, they all kind of look the same. I, I hate to just throw it out there. It's true. I mean, because I see people on both sides of the aisle voting for these bills that are sending our tax money. And listen, I'm a businessman. I pay a lot in taxes. My tax bill this year, I'm already pissed off about. And I spent a lot of money. And you spent, absolutely. you know what I mean? So I spent a lot of money, built more businesses, employed more people to minimize my tax liability because that's a smart thing to do. 100%. You know, uh, keep compounding it. My tax bill is still outrageous. You know, I mean, people get mad when they have to, you know, give the give the government a thousand bucks. Try giving them in the six figures. It's not fun. Nope. And <laughs> it's not fun stroking that check. And knowing where that money's going to. And that's my point. I saw both sides of the aisle, Republican and Democrat. I don't care what side of the aisle you identify as. They all kind of seem like they're doing the same thing to me. And they're all sending my money somewhere else. It seems like everywhere else except for right here in this community, in this country, Florida's been a little bit better, obviously, than the rest of the country. We have an outstanding governor. I personally love DeSantis. Um, But, you know, when I see sending $100 billion, it's probably more than that, but $100 billion to Ukraine, I don't think Ukraine should just fold over and fall uh, to Russia. I think it's very important that Ukraine stays sovereign. That's my personal opinion. I'm not a geopolitical expert, so don't ask me any questions on that. (laughs) I think that they deserve to be Ukraine and stay Ukraine. Right. That being said, sending $100 billion into that country for, you know, all of this, all of this war, all the, uh, you know, all the munitions we're giving them, all the support we're giving them. I get we have to, you know, make a stand somewhere. Then you hear all these rumors, and I don't know if they're substantiated or not. You hear the rumors with FTX. Mm, You hear the rumors of, of, uh, you know, a lot of that Ukraine tax money going into FTX. We already know it's a fact at this point that FTX was funneling money back into the Democrat Party, which was funding their, uh, you know, campaign runs. I'm like, nobody connecting these dots. I'm like, this seems a little crazy to me. Once again, you can't prove it, but you have to wonder how is Ukraine the 
corruption clearinghouse of the establishment. Yeah, it, it certainly begs the question. Because when you look at it, when you unpack it back 2014, when uh, Zelensky was propped up mm-hmm. by, you know, because prior to that, there was a, you know, as I understand it, there was a Russian appointed leader. Zelensky was appoint was then sort of propped up in, I want to say, a sort of a, a it was a revolution or quasi-revolution. He well, was propped up. He was propped up by us. Right, right. He was propped up by the CIA. Yeah. And I, I recall on uh, seeing it on someone's podcast that there was uh, someone within the intelligent net- intelligence network that went on um, Colbert's show and was openly sort of uh, gloating about it. So then they put Biden, the vice president at the time, in charge of Ukraine policy. Mm-hmm. Conveniently, that's when Hunter Biden is on the board of Burisma, right? So conveniently, as I recall, Joe Biden was sort of on a witch hunt to get the prosecutor that was investigating Burisma mm-hmm. in Ukraine to get him fired, to get him relieved of his duties. So once you really pair it back, so as as the, the Joe Biden as sort of a representative of the establishment, it all makes sense why there's such an interest and such just absolute tailwinds going into pumping as much money into Ukraine. I can't prove it. I don't know. Yeah. But it begs the question. And will we ever know? Probably not. Mm. Probably not. And then when, when it does come out, no one will care. Yeah. It'll be like, oh, that's old news. I have a little bit more of an intimate connection because right. I see how much money I pay to the government. And then when I see the government paying massively large sums of money to something that I don't think it should be paying to, I'm like, what the hell did I vote for? Right. Why am I voting? You know, And I think a lot of people feel a little bit disconnected to they the do. whole voting system right now. They you do. Know? Uh, whether, I mean, you know, maybe if you're not, maybe not if you're a Democrat voter right now, maybe you feel really happy because, you know, you your did, team is in, your team is in, your team you know, is in, but, but they're eventually going to be out and they're going to be pissed off. And, you know, this is the and, cycle. Yep. Yep. It's, and, it's constantly an ebb and flow on the politics side. Uh, but man, I mean, if I'm any American, any logical American that's paying a lot of money in taxes, if you're making even close to six figures, you're making, you're paying a lot in taxes. You're paying a lot in taxes. You know? Absolutely. If you're in a multi-million dollar business, if you have several multi-million dollar businesses, you start to now question like, oh, okay, this is now becoming a little bit of a problem. None of my tax money is actually going to fund infrastructure, to help with schooling, Absolutely. to help with anything in this country. And it seems to all be going overseas. They won't even build a damn border wall. And that's but and they that's, funded a border wall in a different country. A hundred percent. I have a saying that scale is the enemy of people. Mm-hmm. Right. The, the people common, the common man. Right. So big business, by and large, it loses that connection to the people because, you know, it's it's just too large. It's just fundamentally it's the dichotomy of scale. Right. It's sure. a dichotomy. And that exists on the governmental side as well. And I think what we've seen is this ever uh, sort of depreciating ROI on tax dollars. And that's why we've seen such a great migration down to Florida. Right. And Texas, because there's no imagine being in Manhattan where you're paying tax on tax on tax on tax on tax on tax on tax. I mean, the, 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 I want to say pre, pre-Reagan, the, the tax rate for the highest income earners was 75%. And that's, a, that's sort of a, that's a, that's a spitball number. But we're also, I mean, look, that's coming off of the same economic or macroeconomic sort of situations as we're in today, right? With, sure. with sort of high inflation, right? We've got a sort of a, economy that's not looking like it's, you know, going to be strong going into 2023. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this is an unprecedented time. We've printed trillions of dollars over the past two years, right? Complete top-down Keynesian economics, Mm -hmm. where you've got too many dollars chasing too few goods. The supply side has been completely ignored. Well, you have very high-profile people that have moved to these states. You have uh, Elon Musk went to Texas from California. You have Joe Rogan, uh, who went from California to Texas. I think there's a, I think Mark Wahlberg just decided to move his family to, to te- uh, Idaho, maybe, or something, something on the West like Coast. Something like that, yeah. Been... But away from California. Yep, yep. He doesn't, he, and he literally said he doesn't want his family exposed to what's going on in the Hollywood area and in California. Right. And more than likely because of taxes. Oh. <laughs> you know what I mean? Absolutely. If you're, if you're making, you know, I'm, you know, my businesses make a couple million bucks. I'm, you know, we're still small businesses. If I'm Mark Wahlberg, who is making hundreds and hundreds of millions as an individual too? As an individual, I don't know the guy's you know financial sure. you know picture, but I'm sure he doesn't have as many sort of like tax write-offs, so to speak, as an individual. Yeah, I know he's very big in business and property, but you know he's getting taxed to the hill. I mean, up in California, there's no way he's not. 
Uh, and then you have, you know, big, big business people. Grant Cardone moved to Florida. Yeah. Ken Griffin. Yeah. Ken Griffin moved down to Miami. You're in Palm Beach, which is basically the richest area in Florida. I think Palm Beach, Windermere, which is here in Orlando. Miami Beach. And Miami Beach. Yeah. Uh, there's like three or four More, pockets. Uh, Fisher, Fisher Island. You got Naples. You got these nice clusters of wealth mm -hmm. that, you know, historically have been retirement resort towns, right? You make your money elsewhere. If you're in the Midwest, you move to Naples. If you're on the East Coast, you move to, you know, South Florida, Palm Beach, down to Miami. Now I feel because of COVID really jogged everything, we're at this point now where people can almost have their cake and eat it too, mm -hmm. right? You can come down here, you can run a successful business. Everything is digital. You run your teams, you can have your offices wherever you need to have your office, but you can have the best of both worlds. And I think that's what we've seen and we're going to continue to see. Um, in touching upon that, with the negative return on your ROI or negative ROI on your taxes. Mm -hmm. Big big cities like Chicago, right? Yeah. In Illinois, they just went on record. There's 12 or 13 laws that are now catch and release. Laws historically that we would take guys, we'd take the bad guys to jail, unarmed robbery, right? Theft plus violence constitutes robbery. Unarmed robbery is now catch and release in Illinois. You know, signed in the law by, by J.B. Pritzker. Unbelievable. Ken Griffin, you know, I think he pledged 220 million to beat or committed 220 million to beat J.B. Pritzker, lost that, pulled his shop, moved it down to Miami, and now he's courting other large businesses to come to South Florida. I mean, that's what's gonna happen. They, they're they calling Miami the next big mega city because New York is destroyed, Chicago's destroyed. You know, a uh, city where I grew up, Cleveland, it's pretty well destroyed. It's Nobody wants to go to Cleveland. People laugh at me when I say I'm from Cleveland, like, oh, you're from Cleveland, mistake on the lake. <laughs> I had the mistake yeah, on the yeah. that lake. That popped into my mind too. I thought yeah, a mistake so on the lake. Everybody says Cleveland, mistake on the lake. I'm like, whatever. I'm like, I'm still a Cleveland Browns fan, even though we suck every year. Ah, I don't care. It's okay. <laughs> at least Johnny Menzel was entertaining. He was entertaining. Yeah. I don't know what he's doing now. Johnny Menzel, even... hold on, hold on. And then who, uh, Baker Mayfield. Mayfield, yeah, yeah. Entertaining. Yeah. You got to have the entertainment value. Yeah, we, you have Deshaun Watson. So yeah, we definitely. You like, you're consistent. Yeah, we definitely are getting entertaining quarterbacks that can't perform at all. Fantastic. But, you know, <laughs> hey, I think we're going to continue to see this trend of migration down to Florida. So now my worry, now I'm a Florida resident. I'm not planning on leaving here. My worry is with all this migration. Right. And all of this pushing of this culture, this woke culture. Are all of these people that are fleeing these areas, are they going to bring that culture down here more? Are they going to bring their voting patterns down here more? Or is it more of the conservative pockets of those states coming into these other states? I think what we we saw during COVID, mm -hmm. and hopefully, I think people understand it, but I don't, I, I want to crystallize it for them. What we saw during COVID is a perfect, boiled down fundamental version of each party's ideology, mm -hmm. right? So when times get stressful, you really see who's who. You know, when what I like the saying, when the tide goes out, you really see, you start to see who's swimming with no, no bathing suit on, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we saw. We saw California, New Jersey, New York, go into immediate lockdown, right? Top-down governmental control. Mm -hmm. These sort of, these politicians believing that they're, they're sort of demagogues in a way, where they get on TV and they love to listen to their voice, yeah. right? And they're going on saying how they're going to be the savior of the day. Whereas in these red states, you know, the, you know, the red states, right? Texas, uh, I think uh, uh, Idaho, um, Arizona, and then Florida, these states that kept it open, they took the data and really placed an emphasis on freedom and individual choice. Where would you rather run your business? Would you rather run your business in a state that tells you, well, no, you can't build a house here or a development here because there's a rare fungus that fungus that only exists here, so you can't build it here. You can't build whatever you want to do here, right? Where it's rent primarily by bureaucrats, where you're spending half a million dollars a year, $500,000 a year on salaries to combat a homeless problem that's only getting worse. And that's what your tax dollars are going to. Or you come down to a free state, right? Where you can free market, the free market can thrive and survive. So I think we're gonna continue to, to, to see that. But I think a lot of the people that are moving down here prescribe to the ideology. Whether or not they identify as Republican, mm -hmm. they at minimum, at minimum, have more conservative values than not. And they're going to appreciate sort of what's been cultivated decades here in Florida. Yeah. So they're, they're going to maybe silently, maybe they, won't, they maybe won't tell their friends, okay. 
Maybe they won't tell their friends they're going to vote for DeSantis, but DeSantis won on a landslide. Uh, he ran, I mean, he won Palm Beach County. Marco Rubio didn't even win Palm Beach County. Yeah. Think about that. Palm Beach County, uh, you know, historically is a very blue county, won it. DeSantis won it handily. Yeah. And in Dade County. So I... It, so is this ideology, is this conservative way of thinking, and we call it conservative, but, you know, it's... Just it's, American. Just American way Just American. <laughs> it's just so, fundamental so bread is this and butter pro, American. is this pro-America, pro-capitalism, um, you know, pro-freedom, is that kind of starting to span all different types of political ideology outside of the major extremes? I mean, and I don't agree with the major right either. Right, the no, extreme 100%. right, I do not agree with. 100%. You know? Just like I don't agree with the extreme left, I think that majority is right in the middle. Um, it's just where where do their votes lie? And voting matters. Uh, yeah. Voting matters. Vote, voting matters. Getting out and voting matters. Being informed on the topics matter. Understanding what legislation is being, you know, whether it's a referendum on a ballot or whatever, mm -hmm. whatever the case may be. Understanding those issues matter. And then voting true to yourself matters as well. But yeah. I think there's a red line in the sand. Uh, and there, or there's a lot, rather, there's a line in the sand that your mainstream Democrat voter will say, because the mainstream is Democrat. It's okay sure. to say. It's the mm -hmm. truth. Uh, your mainstream Democrat voter that's uninformed, not the true believers. The true believers, they will, you know, they're, we they're wearing their Che Guevara shirt to the grave. They don't <laughs> care, right? They're like, hey, I'm here. I'm a comrade of the revolution. Yep. Now, the mainstream Democrat, what they're going to do is they're, there's a line in the sand that they're you know, they're not going to want to cross, then they become politically homeless. And then once you become politically homeless, you become disenfranchised, but you start to go back and ideally, maybe this is me romanticizing it, but you go back and you say, all right, what are the things that I believe in? Who's saying the things that I believe in? Mm -hmm. Let's remove the D or the R. Let's just look at the message and then land in that camp. And I think that individual disproportionately is going to land in the Republican camp. They can be independents, they can be no party affiliation, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, when they see that, they go, okay, yeah, this, this resonates with me, right? Fiscal responsibility, you know, we, we, we don't need to be draconian in anything that we do. Let's just, let's go back to standard American greatness. Yeah, I, I'll take it a step further and I'll even go, I'll even go to what benefits your life the most. Right. You know what I mean? So when I see people and they're like, I am a staunch Democrat, I will support Democrat. I'm like, love it. I'm like, why do you support it? And they will say, you know, I like the, uh, I like the transgender stuff. I like the, you know, uh, you know, I, I support same sex marriage. I'm like, cool. I'm like, me too. And they look at me like, well, you're Republican, right? I'm like, no, I'm fiscally <laughs> conservative. I'm like, I'm probably more socially in the middle. Right. But again, libertarian. I really don't care what anybody else does. Don't force it down my don't throat. Don't force it down your throat. Right. And don't take everything away from me that I'm building. You know what I mean? My family came from a communist country. We came from former Yugoslavia. My family's all Croatian. I'm first generation born in America. You know, my family came here not speaking English with $20 in their pocket. That's how it is. You know, that's the American dream. 100%. My grandparents built a restaurant and bar business. They're still alive today up in Cleveland, Ohio. And they have a, you know, beautiful bar and restaurant. They still work at every single day. American dream. You know, so... What what is that going to look like in several years? Is that even going to be possible anymore? You know, looking at the way the ideology is shifting, looking at the way that everybody's thinking, th there's no logic anymore. To me, I I'm not seeing a logic. So you know, where I'm where I'm seeing myself more in the middle. You know, right. people are people are really separating themselves, and it's it's really become. I don't know. It's really become uh, that red line in the middle. Right. You're right. either on one side or the other. You yeah, know? exactly. When I, no... when I tell people like, well, if you just think logically, what would you rather have? Do you want to pay more taxes or do you want to pay less taxes? Every single person on the planet is going to say, less taxes. Okay, I have the party for you. I have yeah, the person yeah. to vote for. And, and incentives matter too. And, and that's... In incentives. Humans are incentive-based creatures fundamentally. So when you, when you take away that incentive to grow a business, when you take away that incentive to work, mm -hmm. when you take away that incentive to do anything, you're going to have what we're facing, right, what we're facing now. Mm -hmm. You know, you've, you, hand, you hand out all this free money. You say, hey, yeah, you don't have to work. And do people really want to go back to the workforce? No. Do they want to have pride in, in, in going back and working? No. So now we're, once again, we, we end up at this, this specific place, and I like to always remind people, uh, inequality exists everywhere. Inequality is a universal truth. Now, the difference between 
the United States of America and everywhere else in the world is, you know, you're not stuck in a caste. Like, the United States is not a caste system. Mm -hmm. This is the only place in the world. There's no Swiss dream. There's no, you know, there's no Swedish dream. I, I, I Show me the Spanish dream, right? Show me the, the dream that exists in Spain. There's an American dream, and that's ex extremely unique. And that's something that needs to be reminded, and it needs to be top of mind, and it needs to really lead the discourse that we can't lose the idea of the American dream because it doesn't exist anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Nowhere else can you climb socioeconomic rungs like you can in America when you truly bring value. You know, when, when, when you truly bring value and you operate from uh, that perspective first in any relationship that you're in, any business dealing that you're in, I promise you, or, or even business that you're starting, I promise you that you will receive that back tenfold mm -hmm. when you bring value first. That's how I like to run my business. I run my business in a value first proposition, and it doesn't necessarily need to be siloed to real estate. I mean, if, the more I get to learn my client, the more I get to learn sort of what, they, what business they're in, what they can do. How can, I, how can I connect some dots in your world that makes your life better? Right. If you're a private equity guy and you're like, man, I, I, I've got, you know, I've got deal flow, but I need I, I need investors. Right. I say, hey, you know, so and so's doing this. He's it's a it's a great you guys should connect. Mm -hmm. Right. If you're, you know, uh, inspiring your or rather putting out your clients businesses, sharing your clients businesses, really being a value add, because when it, it's it's um, acts in a nature sort of like a flow. Right. It's an energetic flow when you're constantly trying to extract value and not bringing value, that's a one-way street, and eventually that value sort of saps up. People see through that. People Absolutely. see through it. Absolutely. You know, you may you may get away with it for a short amount of time, but eventually you're going to hit a wall, Yeah. and everybody's going to already know you're a taker. You're going to get made. Yeah, 100%. you're going to get made. You're a taker, you're not a giver, and the way that the economy works best is when everything's reciprocal, just like you said. 100%. You know, so that's that's the way the economy really needs to run. Uh, if it runs any other way, which it's it's really going towards right now in the West. You know what I mean? Europe's kind of already a mess as well. Um, we see what's going on with World Economic Forum and everything like that. But when I see the Middle East, when I see Dubai, when I see the UAE becoming more of a capitalist society, business friendly, no or very low corporate tax, right. no personal income tax. When you see that, what are they doing? What are they really mimicking? They're mimicking what the American dream the was. free market, right? They're, mimic they're mimicking the free market system. Now, obviously, they've got uh, cultural and societal expectations that are unique to the Middle East. Of course. And, you know, one could make the argument, perhaps that's what props it up, because there is repercussions for your actions, right? You can't steal in the Middle East. Well, what's funny is when I was in the UAE, and I've been there a couple times, I did a keynote speech there um, last year, yeah, last year in the spring. Um, and when I was there, the one thing I noticed, there's no crime. Uh, the laws and rules, which kind of made me think, I'm like, man, this is kind of like how America probably was in like the 40s, right, 50s, right, 60s. Right. Extremely conservative. Everybody's extremely respectful. You know, not just respectful in the way they behave, but respectful in the way people are dressing, respectful in the way people are treating each other, respectful in traffic. Yep. You know what I mean? Yep. It's really simple things. And I'm like, man, that, that's probably how America was in the, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s. And, you know, coming up into, you know, now where things have kind of gone awry. But like, what is the UAE kind of modeling that on? It's got to be the U.S. It, it's got to uh, be 100%. traditional U.S., you know? So when I see that, I'm like, okay, well, they're literally making it work. People are moving in there in droves. I think the population- A lot of, the, a lot of Europeans, that, from my understanding, are, are, are going to the Middle East. I have uh, numerous friends from the UK that have businesses there. I have numerous friends here in Orlando that have started businesses there because of the tax reasons. Because of the tax you know? benefits, because of the, 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 the pro-free market approach. But what do you have in Europe? You've got a- centralized, overly bloated, overly bureaucratic. And this might be a little Machiavellian view of the world. Mm -hmm. And it probably is, but you know, I think I think it's once you get down to these power systems in the world, it, it comes down to power and money. Right. So don't 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 buy the bill of goods, you know, when they come and they say, well, we're doing it for the people. No, you're not doing it for people. You're not doing it for the people. You're yeah. doing it for your own pockets and your own interests. Yeah. 
don't don't lie to me. I know what your game is. Mm -hmm. I know that once you're done serving on you know in the board of the EU or you know in some sort of position of influence, what you're going to do is you're going to go take up a board seat of a company that you are regulating. I mean, come on. Well, they do it regularly right in front of us. <laughs> I mean, look at what's happening with these politicians and their trades. Yeah. I mean, they're posting they're posting better returns than some of the most productive hedge funds in in the world. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they have information. My favorite, uh, my favorite politician, and this is obviously a joke, Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, how, how long has she been in politics? She's worth like $300 million. I'm like, Damn. Liz Cheney went into office in 2017, so I, as I've read, right, disclaimer, um, with a net worth of $8 million, and she exited with a net worth of $44 million from 2017. I don't know. That's pretty quick. That's, that's a pretty good, now granted... 150 if you're on a, uh, if you're maybe the speaker of the house it bumps up you know but it's definitely not to that number yeah and you know they're starting to, they're starting to be more transparency but it's you know it's one big club and, and we're not in it and we can look from the outside and say ah that's not right but that's what they're doing right that same you know they locked Martha Stewart up for the same thing that um, these U.S. congressmen and, and senators are doing the mm -hmm. same exact thing so how can that be fixed Term limits, in term my opinion. Limits, I think term limits need to happen. I don't know any politician that's doing this that's going to vote for term limits. Apparently, you know, with this whole speaker, uh, this whole speaker debacle that we saw, that was one of the, the action items that needed to be added was producing term limits. From my perspective, when you have all these politicians making millions of dollars as a politician, who's going to vote to end that? No one's going to. No. <laughs> that's what I mean. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, you know, I, I mean, the only thing that I can think of is turn it into a popular vote and let the people decide. A, do you I, want career politicians or do you want politicians that have term limits in Congress? I would think most of the people are going to say term limits. And they need to break up these regulatory agencies. They need to get them out of the beltway. They need to get them out of D.C. You want the, what, the Department of Agriculture? Guess what? We're putting you in Oklahoma. You know, you're going to be out in Oklahoma close to the agriculture. There is nothing not in, be in, there's nothing in Oklahoma. You want to be in the you Department of Ag? I have not. There's nothing in Oklahoma. I was just in Oklahoma. There is two cities and a field. Great. That's and, it. And you know what? And then the Department of Agriculture can figure it out. You want to yeah. be the CIA? Take the CIA headquarters, put it in, let's say, put it in Louisiana. You know, take the FBI, break up this sort of uniparty, this mm -hmm. revolving door in D.C. You know, take the FDA, put it closest to the industry that it's supposedly serving. Right. So you can get more engagement from from the sort of individual at the grassroots. So you don't go from the FDA or you don't go from, let's say, uh, from Pfizer and then you go or let's not use Pfizer because I know it's a very hot button issue. Let's say you don't go from the board of one of these companies to or, or from uh, a regulatory body to a company, then you're a lobbyist. And then but you're not changing your geography at all. You're just going a few streets away. Mm -hmm. Let's break that up. Let's just break up the your, convenience. Uh, business card. Yeah, you're changing your business card, but you're still on, on you know, K Street in Washington. Yeah. Right? Let's move that around. Let's break that up a little bit. If, you know, I know that's that's pie in the sky. Yeah. I almost sound like a communist with that level of, uh, of sort of utopian view of how to affect change. I mean, something's got to give. There's, there's two ways that this country is going to go. It's either going to go very far downhill and hopefully recover, um, or it's going to need a rude awakening wake-up call that's going to be a snap. Right. And it, there, there's no other way it's going to go. The, the way the trajectory of the country is going, it's, it's going downhill. We're in tremendous debt. Uh, nothing is really being solved. It seems like bureaucrats run the show, uh, and everybody's getting rich except for the people, and the people are getting stepped on. Yep. And poverty is now worse than ever. Inflation is worse than ever. It's harder than ever to make money in this country. So it's hard to keep it. It's hard to keep it because they want to take it and give it away or put it back in their own pockets, depending on what uh, quote unquote conspiracy theory you believe. All my conspiracy theories spoiler came alerts. true. All my conspiracy <laughs> theories came true the over the last alerts. couple of years. Well, that's why also when you go back to it and you look at the, the, the core components of each party, where are in which states are middle class is the middle class thriving? Mm -hmm. Right. It's all the red states. There sure. is no middle class in California, you're either making hundreds of thousands of dollars north of a quarter million a year just to have a quote, you could say, or make the argument of middle class existence, but it's the Uber elite and it's everyone else. Yep. And the Uber elite disproportionately, Silicon Valley, let's say in California, 
disproportionately influences the policy. And you have the entire dependent class. And that is, if California is the bastion, if that's the framework in which the modern day left of the Democratic Party works off of, you already have what, you know, you already have your forecast there. Just look at what's happening in California. Rampant taxes, rampant crime, rampant rampant homelessness, Mm -hmm. all of the societal ills. Meanwhile, the, the, the most wealthy and well-connected live behind these these walls with firearms. They're well-protected. They're mm-hmm. well-fed. They don't have to worry about these issues. They pay their pittance. Google prints money, so they pay their pittance. And then the state of California then disperses it to keep and quell and keep a docile um, sort of the class of subordinates who really aren't looking to do anything. They just want to live in the teat of government. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think this social experiment that's been going on over the last... I don't know. What would you say? Decade? I'd say it's, everything got weird in 2016. Yeah, so I'd almost, like almost f- a decade. 15, 16, about a decade. Yeah, yeah things so got weird. Things, things started weird. getting a little squirrely, and uh, I think they've only gotten more progressively weird where we're kind of living in imagination land uh, in a lot of aspects of culture and society. Um, something's got to give. It's going gonna, it's gonna to hit a wall soon. Right. And I think that line in the sand that you were talking about earlier, um, I hit it during COVID. Right. My line in the sand was when people started saying that I didn't have the choice to do certain things. And I'm like, this is America. I'm pretty sure I have the choice. And, you know, everybody can go F off. I don't care. You know what I mean? You don't want me in your store because I'm not going to wear a mask. Cool. Don't care. Fine. Yeah. That's 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 your private business. That's That's your right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, You know, when I would get confronted by a patron and the store did not require masks and somebody in the patient started screaming in my face about not wearing a mask. I'm like, dude, call the cops. It's not illegal. Talk to store manager. They don't require it. Go away. You know what I mean? Th- this is not your show. This is not your world. You don't get to control everybody around you. hundred percent. So, you know, when this all hits that line in the sand for most people, which I don't know how it hasn't for a lot of the population, uh, you know, the mask thing, the vax thing, you know, uh, the lockdown thing, I'm not having any of it. That's not America to me. That's not freedom. Uh, That's not how society works in this country. And I'll fight to defend that. You know, I'm very, very big on on my personal freedom, the freedom of my family, uh, the freedom to be able to feed yourself, to run a business, to go to work and to not be forced to do any medical interventions you don't want to do. That's me. Those were my lines in the sand. But, you know, I think people are starting to hit them. Right. You see people pushing back on the uh, what's the what's the thing? The drag queen bingo? Oh, the, the, the dra- drag, queen, drag queen story hour. Now, I said three years, three, I'd say three years ago, mm-hmm. I said, you know, in five years, what we're going to see is we're going to see uh, pedophilia being normalized as a sexual preference. I said five years. It's happening. So we're, I'm well ahead of my, well ahead of the curve in that prediction. You know, they've actually assigned an acronym to it. And you know, once acronyms start rolling out, it's serious. It's MAPS, Minor Attracted Persons. That's a real thing? That's a real thing. Yeah, that's, look it up. All right, I'm not gonna hit on that because we're gonna get banned on YouTube and Instagram. But, and I'm, <laughs> but I'm telling you, it's coming. You can see it. So is that going to be the line in the sand where people say, "All right, this is really an, a, and I've spent time with my niece this last several days and mm-hmm. how impressionable she is. It's cr- they these ch- these toddlers they mimic everything you do. Now I don't have kids of my own, but. Everything you do, they mimic. Mm-hmm. I have a five-year-old Everything niece. Everything you do, they mimic. So you're going to tell me that it's wrong to protect those kids from the, the, these, these sexual perversions? You're going to tell me that that's wrong when these kids will literally, you know, do anything that you do? Mm-hmm. No, that, that's criminal. Yeah. That's absolutely, absolutely morally and just unconscionable. And then you'll have people that'll fight back against that. I don't get it. I'm telling you, I don't get it. I don't get. That's your line in the sand. Yeah. That's when people go, all right, now you're just, it's a race to the bottom. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. you've, 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 you know, overshot the bottom. Now you're just, you're well beyond reason. So I can't even, I can't even get along with this anymore. Do you have any aspirations for politics personally? <sighs> you know, it comes up focusing on my business right now. Okay. Uh, really, really doubling down in that. You know, we've 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 had a great last year. We're going to have a tremendous year this year. So uh, the, the the conversation comes up, and I always like to say we'll see. Okay. Because I have to talk with my boss, my sure. wife, sure. because you know, because <laughs> it's a it's a big commitment. 
It is. It's, it's a big commitment. It's a life changer. And and I'm definitely double down in my convictions, and which is why I'm obviously comfortable in speaking with you and mm -hmm. being out there. I have no problem because I'm versed enough to understand it, but also at the same time, is that something that at this juncture, maybe perhaps in the future, but at this very moment, you know, I you're, don't know. you're a we'll young see. guy. I mean, yeah, so you got some you got time. time, you know, got some time. People usually don't get into politics uh, too young. I would say, you know, wait until you're uh, in your maybe 40s or 50s. That's one, you know. But I think that's to, I know I'm contradicting myself, but I think getting young people engaged, because these are very, you know, conservative th thought is complex and it's nuanced and it's not, you, can, you can't shrink it down to sloganeering like the left does, like eat the rich, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. tax the rich, all that stuff. You can't boil it down. It's long form. It takes years to understand what it is. And I think being able and being a younger face, applying these principles for young people to see like, oh, you're telling me that a young person doesn't need to prescribe to or subscribe to socialism or communism or mm -hmm. collectivism in, in any iteration, any ism mm -hmm. that's not capitalism. That's a that's a that's a great talking point. That's a great ability to position, you know. And I think message. that's I think that's what I really am excited about doing here on the podcast, bringing people like you on here and getting these conversations going because you are a younger face. I'm. I, how old You're are you? You're young. How old are you? Thirty-two. Okay, so I'm. Uh, I'll be thirty. I don't know how old I am. How old am I? Thirty-eight. <laughs> I'll be thirty. I don't know. I'm thirty-eight or thirty-nine, somewhere in there. <laughs> I was born in eighty-five. So you know, I'm pushing forty. Right. You know what I mean? I'm. I'm getting. I'm getting to that age where you know I'm seeing people in the gym, and they look like they're twelve years old to me, and they're twenty. And I'm like, shit, I'm getting old. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, people that are in their 20s and early 30s, like, yeah, like you you need to become thought leaders for these newer generations because it's really important. When I when I talk about it, if my beard gets any more gray, you know, when I talk about it, they're going to be like, ah, it's just an old dude. Yeah, it's you just know an what old mean? guy. Just an old, older guy, business 100%. guy, whatever. You know, if you get somebody young, fresh face talking about these values and what made America, America, I think that's going to be the real progressive change the country needs. Is it is it something that is going to be exactly the same as we had in the 40s, 50s, 60s? No, I think it's going to be better. I think it's going to be better because it's going to be more inclusive. 100%. It's going to, you know, uh, we're not going to have the issues that we had with women's rights, with right. with the racial segregation and things like that. This country is supposed to be available and open to every single person, woman, man, any color you are, any race you are, any religion you are. When it turns into that, with the values that made this country great, man, we're, we're going to be unstoppable. We're closer to utopia there yes, in that specific scenario than we are closer to a utopia where government runs the show from the top down because mm -hmm. that's never worked. Tell me a one time in history when government has had unilateral control that it's ended well. It hasn't. hasn't happened. I, I mean, communism, socialism, any of that mm -hmm. stuff. It doesn't. It just doesn't work. Yeah. It well, just doesn't. Every great civilization that's ever been has went down this path that we're going down, and they have ended. It's an absolute symptom of abundance. And I'm not saying we should be less abundant as a country, but we need more people to stop being reactive and start being proactive in the information that they consume and, and really have a hearty, a healthy mistrust of government. A healthy mistrust of government. Well said. You know, you have that healthy mistrust you're questioning, you're not railing against the machine yet, but you're saying that that story doesn't make sense. You maybe want that unpacked. Yeah, exactly. Give me a little bit more detail to that. Mm -hmm. Why is X this way? So why did X lead to Y? Mm -hmm. Just those questions, like have a health, but the education system doesn't encourage that. The education system doesn't encourage thoughtful introspection. It doesn't encourage failure. It doesn't do any of that. Mm -hmm. It just literally promotes compliant people. Compliant people that aren't going to question anything. Where can people uh, find you, your information, your company, your business? David.Burke on Instagram. Okay. That simple. Um, you know, I don't have any, I'm not cool enough to have any podcasts yet. Um, but yeah, David.Burke, David, David I'm down in Palm Beach, Florida, West Palm Beach, Florida with, with Compass um, and my own little team. I work with my wife. We, we run a pretty, a pretty tight ship down there, producing great results for clients and for investors and developers. So, um, you know, check me out. Thanks for coming over here, man. I appreciate your talk. I appreciate all the information you gave. I think people are going to get a lot of information from you. And I hope so. I really hope you keep spreading this message because it needs to be heard by younger generations, by our generation, 
and even by the older generations. This is important for the future of the country. I hope so. Absolutely. Thanks, man. If you guys want to watch more of this content, take a click right here. You can get more videos. 